everybody jackie page here and it is time for another edition of girl talk live you know we are getting in the nitty and gritty of everything when it comes to women's health our insides our outsides all of that type of good stuff and today we are talking about what's going on down there yes down there that's what we're talking about because it is one of those things that we don't talk about enough and we need to address because it's a part of who we are. So today with me, and I'm super excited to have her with me, um, I have Dr. Brianna Walton, board certified OBGYN in female pelvic medicine and reconstructive surgeon and the director of female pelvic medicine with UM Capital Region Health. How are you doing, Dr. Walton? Love and life. Thank you. Hey. Life is good. <laughs> we have a lot to talk about today. I I know, and I'm excited. And I will uh, keep my comments PG uh, for now. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, you know, take it as far as you need to. We'll see we're that. introducing this topic, right? We want recording this topic. We want to go slow and make sure everybody's comfortable with it. But when exactly. it's time, we'll take the gloves off and we can do whatever. Exactly. So you're probably wondering, hey, like, what exactly are we talking about? And I told you we're going to talk about things that happen down there, including, you know, maybe you laugh or you sneeze and, sneeze and you have a little leakage happen. Or maybe there's some discomfort going on while you're having sex. Is this normal? Is this something that you have to live with? You are a female pelvic specialist. What exactly is the pelvic floor and why is it important in the overall health of a woman? Sure. So um, I think female pelvic floor disorders are somewhat of a misnomer. People think it's just about muscles. Uh, and they're like, oh, you do disc kegels or you are someone who, if you're in a car accident and you hurt your pelvis, that's what you do. But the pelvic floor really comprises every organ that lives within the pelvis. So everything, if you put your hands on your hips, that's below that point. And so that means it's your, it's your bladder, it's your vagina, it's your rectum. It's the muscles, it's the tissues that support those areas. It's the ligaments that glue the uh, muscles to the bone. So it's everything within the pelvis. Because a lot of the issues that you just brought up are involved in it. It's not general like everybody who has pelvic pain is because they have an infection or because they have fibroids. That's not the only reason. So we are kind of like the private eyes of the pelvis trying to figure out what is going on down there. So one of the things that may be going on down there that a lot of women experience but mm -hmm. don't want to talk about is having some leakage. And I'm saying like, Hey, I sneeze and oops, something came out or I laugh and there's some leaking there. Is that a normal thing? So it's common, right? But it's not normal. It is a part of some of the processes that happen when um, primarily when women have babies. Um, you change some of the structures because there's a passenger that goes through and changes the orientation of the tissue and the muscles. And a lot of women will complain of intermittent leakage. It's the technical name is stress incontinence. Um, but generally speaking, if it doesn't bother you, it doesn't really bother me. Okay. But when it comes to the point where it's starting to interfere with your activities, like say you're not playing tennis anymore or you're not um, dancing like you used to, right? You yeah. wanted to do certain moves and you know if you go down too low, you're going to lose a little urine and that's embarrassing for a lot of people. So that's when it becomes a problem and you should see somebody. Now, if I go see somebody, so I come to you to figure out exactly like what this is, um, is there a cure for it or is this something that I actually have to live with for the rest of my life? Good questions. Great questions. So I think there's a range and a lot of women don't understand that you don't have to have surgery for it, although that's you know my focus. I do pelvic floor surgeries. But before we get there, um, a lot of women are taught to do Kegels and you may have heard of them, those pelvic floor exercises. It's the exercise when you contract your muscles, almost like you're trying to 
pull up the pelvis to your belly button and tighten and hold it. That's a Kegel. Well, a lot of women try to do them, but they don't do them right. Mm -hmm. And so they're really doing something that's not helpful. There are devices out there that we utilize. Um, we will sometimes prescribe uh, weights. We'll prescribe um, their wands and devices to actually place in the vagina to help with those contractions, to help you figure it out. They actually measure how strong your pelvic floor is so you can know that you're getting better. Mm -hmm. um, the One of the best ways is a pelvic floor physical therapist because she can give you feedback to say, yeah, it's long, but it's not strong, or we need it to do this. I'd like you to do it while you're standing. So almost like a personal trainer for the pelvis. Okay. Um, some of the other things that are available are off-label uses of our um, laser therapies and that sort of thing. So like vaginal rejuvenation. But generally speaking, we move forward. If you fail physical therapy, if you're not doing well, or you just don't like the idea of putting even a device in the vagina called a pessary. Mm -hmm. It's like a little plastic um, diaphragm, looks like a diaphragm that you slide inside of the vagina to push up on the area that's loose and it keeps you from leaking. But a lot of women are like, I don't want to do that. I'm too young for that, which I you know, don't often yeah. disagree. Question. Um, incontinence, is that something that I know you mentioned like after um, you have a child, that's something that a lot of women experience just because your body does go through a lot. Is it something that a woman can experience before having kids or not having kids at all? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, and we have to think that incontinence happens commonly when you've had a baby because of the changes in the anatomy. But it can also happen just from a genetic standpoint, like some people are more flexible. And so that connective tissue, the ability to stretch tissues can happen. Let's say somebody was um, a competitive ap athlete and there was a lot of high impact mm -hmm. that can make you more prone, uh, uh, especially my, my patients who have been um, doing more in the way of weight lifting or weight bearing. Um, I'll really see it much more commonly. Yeah really good to know i honestly like didn't know that because i'm a personal trainer um ah, but the, you, I, I, yeah. it's something i didn't know i didn't know that like lifting weights and i don't have any kids but i didn't know that like lifting weights and doing high impact exercises can definitely lead to incontinence so this is really not only good information for everybody's watching but Thank also for you. Oh. i'm glad you mentioned that because you know i've had to graduate from some personal trainers because they were trying to make me perform in a way that I knew I was going to peel myself if I kept doing something. So um, you really do need to be aware of your clientele because especially in some of the older patients, you just have to do, as you know, more repetitions as opposed to doing heavier weights or weight bearing um, just to allow them some dignity while they're trying to get their, their bodies in order. No, completely understand. For um, the women who haven't had kids um, mm -hmm. that may be experiencing incontinence, I know we talked about some of the things that you could do um, if you've had kids. Is there like a different treatment for women who are experiencing incontinence without kids? Yeah. So um, besides some of the techniques we talk about with uh, physical therapy and the pessary devices, um, sometimes you need medications. Uh, it depends on the flavor of the leakage. So if you're a cough, laugh, sneeze leaker, that's usually more mechanical. If you're, oh my God, I got to go to the bathroom. I'm going to pee on myself. That's usually more medical. And we will sometimes start with medications and even sometimes progress to Botox in the bladder. A lot of people are surprised when they say Botox, the same stuff you use on your face. I'm like, yes, it is the same because it basically paralyzes muscles or tissue and allows the bladder to fill up and hold more and hold more comfortably without giving you that sense of urgency. You got to get there fast. Um, go ahead. You had a no, question. No, I was saying, no, I was saying interesting. <laughs> yeah. And then a, a lot of my patients, they're surprised by those therapies that are available because they just came available in the last five to 10 years. Um, again, some of the off-label things that can happen just to sort of enhance the tissue tone 
um, aren't always our primary way and they aren't always covered by insurance. So I don't usually use that as my first go-to. I will think about other things that can be covered by insurance. Okay. Um, are there any, because you mentioned earlier, like surgeries, are there any surgeries that um, can be performed to kind of help with this? Okay. Lots of surgeries, but it depends. If you're a dripper, you know, versus things dropping, you are leaking in this because of the area right up underneath the urethra is weak. We will sometimes use something called a sling. It looks like a little hammock. It's like a little piece of plastic. I didn't I can find them, but uh, uh, you basically go inside of the vagina and make a small incision and then tunnel on both sides and anchor the sling to the tissue or to one of the muscles mm -hmm. and adjust the tightness of it so that um, if a woman decides to do the surgery with me with a spinal anesthesia, meaning she's awake, but she doesn't feel anything like she's having a baby, she doesn't feel anything below the belt. I can have her cough and I can tighten up the sling to the point where she stops leaking. And then once I'm there, I stop, I cut the string and close the incision, which is a lot different than what I used to do 20 years ago when we had to make a big C-section scar and pull up the tissue. We were never sure how quite tight to make it. We could over tighten and then you wouldn't pee or not tighten enough and then you would still leak. This is when I tell you a lot of great information right now. I'm just like, <laughs> I do know. Like, it's one of those things we hear a lot about. Um, I think we, as women, we talk about it, but it's not mm -hmm. something that's talked about enough. So, mm -hmm. you hear women dealing with incontinence, and it's just mm -hmm. like, oh, well, it's something that I have to live with. And there's actually options out here that yes. are available to kind of help um, with the surgery. If that's something that somebody's interested in doing, uh, what's the downtime for that? So I'm, I'm pretty maternal in my oversight of patients because truthfully, I don't trust women. I don't trust that um, they won't start doing too much for everybody else. Okay. And so if I say you're fine at four weeks, at two weeks, they're already doing something. This is true. So I generally give a long time frame. I said, please, Take care of yourself like you're going to take care of your sister or your, you would tell your daughter. Don't just think that you have to get back in action to prove I'm strong. I, I can have a surgery and get back at it right away. No, take the time to let the tissues start to heal because a lot of the, the surgeries that we do require your body to engraft into the tissue that I'm placing or the material I'm placing. And it's like walking on wet cement. So if you if you walk on it too early, you're going to leave an imprint. So for the surgery aspect, if you do too much too soon, sometimes that sling loosens up and it's not going to be where I want it to. And then you're going to start leaking again. And we're going to have to talk about another surgery, which I prefer to try to do one and done. I, I think a lot of people will prefer one and done. <laughs> to your point, right. it's important that, like you said, um, you have to take the appropriate and the right amount of time just to sit down and chill out and breathe, stretch and shake so that it can be a one and done type of situation. I mean, it's so interesting because a lot of times in June, like June is usually my teacher's month. Teachers usually say, oh, when I get out of school, I'm going to go ahead and have my surgery. And so I'll end up doing a lot of teachers during this season and they they will take their June and a little bit of July time frame to kind of get themselves together. And then they'll go start doing whatever they want. Uh, for my patients that are a little bit older, they would prefer to get through the holidays. And so I do a lot of surgeries in January for, for them because it's, it's cold out. They don't care that they can't get outside. You know, they want to just be able to recover when and have people come over and visit them. Yeah. Right. So you just, you know, part of what I'm, I do, I think, is not just to listen to what's happening below the belt, but to understand, well, what's your individual situation so we can navigate that that works out best for you. Because women will not always make decisions just based on what's happening. They'll they'll make decisions based on what's happening all around them and then they'll wrap that into it. Yeah, I mean, that's- That's the way we are, right? That's, that's, that's real, that's who we are, that's what we it do. Is. 
nurturers by nature. We like to yes. make sure that everything and everybody around us is taken care of. So no, it definitely makes sense. Um, you also deal with bowel control. What exactly is that? Can you give us more detail? Mm. So if people are embarrassed by urinary issues, they are mortified by bowel. And what I'm talking about, so um, the young lady who will say, I go to bend over and a little fart comes out or I'm intimate and things are passing or I uh, can't control my bowel or the opposite, I'm struggling to get it out. I have to sit a certain way, move my body, lift my legs. You know, I look like I'm doing circus tricks in the bathroom in order just to empty my bowels out. And a lot of times they think that's just me. I got to deal with this for the rest of my life. But again, part of what I try to do is this sort of investigation of is it muscle? Is it tissue? Is it neurologic? What is is it the position of the organ? What is the dysfunction? And sometimes it's a combination and sometimes it's treatable. Um, a lot of patients will be surprised when I tell them, I see on the exam, oh my gosh, you have a little pocket here. Does it ever feel like the stool is right there and you can't get it out? It just won't come out? Just, How do you know? And I'm like, well, that's part of what I, what I see. And actually just sitting and putting your feet up on a stool or a squatty potty will help that elimination process. Mm -hmm. We'll cut down on some of the need to strain, which then also can cause problems with hemorrhoids or fissures or any of the things that people don't want to have below the belt. Mm -hmm. Whew, this is... <laughs> It's good. This is really good information. Again, stuff we don't really talk about, but we you know it's, it is. It tends to be a secretive, right? Like, yeah, it really does. Like, you may have a conversation with like one of your best friends, and it's just kind of like you leave it at that. But as women, we go through a lot. I mean, our hormones. You have kids. Like, we our bodies do a lot of changing as we age. So for a lot of women to go through this and it be something that is really taboo and we don't talk about, it's really interesting. So I, that's one of the reasons why we had to sit down and talk today. Cause I'm like, we can't keep doing this. This is 2021. We have got that's to get right. this together. We have got to live our best life. Well, no longer should we be. Uh, so, you know, I say vagina a lot and a lot of people are like, oh, you say vagina. But why is that not normal? We say yeah. erectile dysfunction. We say penis all the time. That's mm -hmm. that's normal. So we've got to be more comfortable with the language that we use to describe yeah. our bodies, to describe ourselves. We have to improve our own health care education, health care literacy so that we can advocate for our family members and advocate for ourselves better when we are able to use the language that correctly describes how we feel and how it makes us feel then I think we do a better job of taking care of one another. Yeah. So we talked about incontinence. We talked yes. about bowels. Yes. We gotta get to sex because that has, to do, that has to deal with and it has to do with our vaginas as well. Um, you, um, what are some causes of discomfort during sex? Because that's something else that deals with the vagina, vagina and a lot of women deal with um, throughout their lives. So I think it's always important when I'm seeing a patient, I'll ask them a few questions. If it hurts, where does it hurt? Is it on entry or is it deeper inside? Because that can be very different in my approach and the thoughts of what potentially are the causes. On the external or more on the outside, like with penetration, a lot of my postmenopausal women are just dry. Um, their tissues have thinned out because of lower hormones. And this process starts not at, you know, 65 or 55. It starts at 45 and sometimes even 40. So you can start seeing differences pretty early on and depending on how long you've been on a birth control. So for some of my patients who've been on birth control forever, right? They So they're in a hormone deprived sort of situation where they're taking a very set amount of hormone through the birth control, the tissues respond differently and they're sometimes thinner and more uncomfortable. Uh, as we go deeper inside, the one of the more common reasons is just the muscles. The muscles of the pelvic floor, 
especially if you have back problems, because as you start to bear weight differently or you walk differently or you sit differently, and a lot of people who've been staying at home and sitting at a desk and holding their bodies in certain postures, yeah, it's like, what's going on here? Like my leg hurts, my hip hurts. And then subsequently they might start having more issues with intercourse. Um, I think as people have also stayed home, they've also either become less active or more active, right? Like they, they're exploring more. And so yeah. just like any other exercise, if you are beginning to increase your activity, we have to exercise those muscles in order for them to feel more comfortable. Um, and learning about your body helps you to do that. Uh, what positions are more comfortable for you may reflect not just the muscles, but also the anatomy. And one of the things we didn't talk about is that sometimes the organs, if you think about the vagina like a room, mm -hmm. in that room, if it's if it's a normal room, it's fairly narrow, the ceiling is up and that's where the bladder lives and the floor down is where the rectum lives. And sometimes you can see speed bumps, like the rectum is pushing up into the, the, the vagina and people will describe it hurts or it feels like I'm going to have a bowel movement with intercourse. Or they'll describe discomfort because the bladder is dropping down and it's getting pushed on and they feel like they need to empty their bladders. And sometimes they actually do. Mm -hmm. um, so those are the things that I would look for. Anatomical issues, dryness, Look, listen to their hormone history. And some of the common things that we see, especially in our community, are fibroids because they can be the size of a penny, but they can also grow to be the size of a melon, right? So they vary in their size and their shape and their position. And if they're sitting in certain places, like kind of like a sumo wrestler, they're not going to move. You know, when you're intimate or active, you're not going to be able to push it out of the way. And so it's going to be uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. Um, and then I would think also sometimes about endometriosis, which is a real common problem for women who are still having regular periods where some of the tissue inside of the uterus spills outside and it makes scar tissue. And so things stick together. And if things don't move easily, sex can be painful. So we talk about like the level of pain um, during intercourse. At what point in time should somebody go see a doctor if I'm having a course and I Ever. really like whatever, you know, because I think there's just not enough information. We, I mean, how much did you, did, did my mom didn't teach me about sexual pain? My, nobody told me about it. So it's one of those things that if it's happening, we want to know about it. Um, and we want to know, can we do something about it? So I think until there are more forums and until there are more, crucial conversations like we're having right now to put out there the common reasons why people hurt. Um, they need to ask their, their docs. They need to ask someone who actually might know what the heck is going on. Now, is it, do I, is it, hey, I've had intercourse one time and I had pain or is it one of those things where it's just like, this is continuously happening or maybe it's like a spot, like maybe once here, maybe once there. Um, is there like a number of times that this needs to happen where I need to actually go see a doctor? That's a good question. I think for, let's say, for example, it ha has happened one time and you're freaking out. Oh my God, it hurt so bad. Uh, I, I never want to do it again. That is okay for you, the uh, patient to come and see us because I'm going to walk them through. Okay. This is maybe normal. And then perhaps after with time and changes in your anatomy, because the opening of the vaginal area is not very wide. And with more activity, you're going to stretch it out. Mm -hmm. Or even for the woman who has not been active for a period of time, like they've been celibate and then they re-enter the game and then they're like, uh oh, it didn't feel good. So those are fine for us to come fun for them to come see us and you know get some understanding of what is going on. But if it's happening repeatedly, I would ask they would come in, just make an appointment. There's no particular number or time. It really is, again, when you see your gynecologist, those are questions you can ask them. But if if you're not getting the information you need, it might be an opportunity for a referral uh, for our services 
just because you know I'm the vagina whisperer. That's the language I speak. I talk about vagina all day long. Yeah, definitely makes sense. Um, so I've had pain during intercourse. I come mm -hmm. to you, I get some treatments. How long is it gonna take for me to get my <laughs> your mojo back? Yeah, how long is it gonna take me to be a hot girl again? <laughs> to be what? A hot girl again. <laughs> I love it. Okay. So it depends on the nature of your pain. And if it is primarily dryness. And so a lot of times I'll start off with like, let's say the most, one of the more common is um, vaginal dryness from being postmenopausal. So I'll use a little bit of topical estrogen. I'll take a little bit of medication and we'll use it like a lotion at the opening. So it's more comfortable. But the one of the quickest ways to figure out if it's dryness is just using a little coconut oil. Coconut oil is a great moisturizer. It's an antimicrobial. It is something you can use just every day to put a little bit down there, even without intercourse, just to enhance the moisture. But you could also use it as your lubricant instead of, now, I gotta be careful, gotta be careful because you can't use it with the condom because that thing will burst and that thing won't break. And so instead of being in pain because of this, you'll be in pain because you're delivering a baby. And that's so, Oh, that's one thing we have to be concerned about. But <laughs> in general, if it if it is a hormonal issue, it takes us usually like two to three months to try to improve the uh, vaginal tissue. Mm -hmm. If it's more of a mechanical problem, it may require surgery. If it's more of a structural issue like the fibroids and or endometriosis, again, that might require surgery. It might require hormone um, suppression in order to shrink some of that abnormal tissue. You mentioned coconut oil, and I got to rewind it back real quick. Here we um, go. Is there a particular type of coconut oil? Is it just a coconut oil? <laughs> no, I, at my local store? Like, okay, don't get the garlic variety. Okay, just use it. It should be regular, <laughs> and uh, I would tend to use an organic and a virgin coconut oil. Um, again, it's not, it's hypoallergenic. So most women can tolerate it very well. It's soothing. And sometimes I'll say, keep a little bit in the refrigerator because it's nice even after intercourse for the micro trauma. So you can just use it as a, a nice little lubricant and to kind of heal the areas that are uncomfortable. Hmm, you learn something new every day. Coconut oil. Every day. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah. um, uh, <laughs> uh, so, I know this, this, this can go. I told you I was going to stay PG for this, right? I told you. So we can go further, but right now we'll stay here because I think this is a really good way to introduce some of this subject matter to the audience, just so that they start to feel more comfortable that the things that are happening aren't abnormal or aren't unusual that other women are dealing with it and that there are answers, right? So when you, when women come into your office and they talk to you about some of the things that they are experiencing, um, what's like one of the most common reasons why, you know, women don't say anything or why they don't seek treatment earlier? I think they don't always feel like they're in a safe space. Um, I'm very, you, you can tell I, I use a lot of humor to disarm my patients to just try to make them feel more comfortable. But I think the most important thing, and I say this a lot, is that when I when they walk in that room, it, it's got to feel like a sacred space. Like whatever they say in that room is going to stay in the room. I'm not going to go out and tell anybody. They're not going to be embarrassed by what I say. I'm not going to judge them. So they can fully just like offload whatever is bothering them. And that's Sometimes as providers, we don't often allow that to happen, either for time, personalities, cultural differences, whatever. We, we don't always perceive what patients need in that time and space. So fortunately, I have the luxury of being able to talk to people for a period of time to try to understand what's going on. And do you see women of all ages? I think that's another thing um, that... I want to get across to people that are watching today is that it's just not a particular age. It's not um, 50 and older. It's not 40 and older. Like 
Do you right. see you're, one? You're so right. I've I've had eight year olds come in my office um, with complaints of vaginal itching, uh, which is not uncommon for toilet paper to get stuck in spaces and places, and then they start getting infections. And their moms are, don't know, know what to do. Sometimes the pediatricians are not quite sure. Um, I've had women who are 99 and the main concern they have is don't let my wig, you know, fall off during the exam. <laughs> but, but, you know, that span of life is, does not, age doesn't reflect the, the, it reflects the quantity of life, right? But I'm interested in the quality and that can go anywhere along that spectrum. So any age, as early as eight to 99. So we all fall on a spectrum of, it, yes. it, could, be, it could be you. Um, yes. It's okay if it is you. Dr. Walton is here to help you. That is why we are having this conversation today. Got to ask you really quickly about organ um, prolapse. What exactly is that? So some of the bowel just, you know, my family likes to joke with me and say, yeah, if it drips or it drops, she's your doctor. Um, so part of what happens is that some of the organs can protrude or herniate into the vagina. And so the support system, the tissue, it's a tissue issue, not a muscle issue, where you start to see things sagging down. The bladder is not where it's supposed to be. So someone will even describe, you know, say, well, is it an any or an alley? And they're like, what are you talking about? It's like your belly button. Does it come outside of the, the vaginal opening? Are there protrusions that you can see or feel? And that's fairly advanced prolapse. Mm -hmm. Most of the time, patients have some degree of prolapse many years before it becomes an Audi. And because when we go see our gynecologist, we're basically coming in for one kind of transactional visit. I need a pack. And so we put in our speculum, we push the prolapse back, we look at the cervix, get what we need and get out. And we sometimes miss early stage prolapse. And so there's subtle things that people need to start picking up on. I think one of the most interesting things, and, I, and patients always laugh, like, how did you know? Um, not so much the leakage like we talked about, but even the pee doesn't come out straight anymore. When I'm standing over the toilet trying to empty my bladder, I pee down my leg. I don't know why that's happening now. And that can be an early sign of prolapse. The, the bladder's out of position. So you're having to pee around a curve in order to pee. So that and then just some of the symptoms we talked about before with your bowels needing to manipulate, having to take toilet paper and hold it in a certain place or space so it's easier for the stool to come out or having to sit up on one cheek. All those little things can be subtle signs of prolapse and part of what we try to do is grade it or decide how severe it is on our visits to talk about options. Is this watch and wait? Is this, let's use a device. Is this augment some of your exercises, like your pelvic floor exercises and use the device at the same time or is this surgical? Now, if I'm experiencing this, um, mm -hmm. And I do need to get surgery. Um, what's the schedule on that? Because this sounds like this is something that's a little, a little more in depth than some of the other things that we've uh, talked yeah. about. Today. And I think it depends. So I have a lot of patients who've waited a really long time. In fact, I have uh, one lady, which part of the problem with some of these things is that they cause other more serious problems. So if your pelvic organs are out to the point where you can see or feel them, things are going to get kinked off and you potentially can hurt your kidneys or you start walking funny and you might, you're more prone to falls and hip fractures, mm -hmm. especially in my older patients. And my younger patients, subtly, they can start having complaints of like, painful intercourse or things just not feeling right. It doesn't feel the same anymore. Something's not right in that mental frustration. If I have to do a, a reconstruction I, that's for younger patients, it's generally as an outpatient, you know, okay. they come in, I do the surgery. It takes me like two to three hours. 
Um, I send them home the same day and within six weeks, they're kind of back to their normal activities. But I always tell them, let's be aware of who you are now. You're, you're a girl who now is more prone to stretchiness and you just got to be smarter. You got to navigate this world in a different way so that it makes sense. So, yeah, I know you like doing, you know, 50 pounds of weight, but maybe go down to 25, you know, that sort of thing. Um, over a period of time. If it's a big robotic surgery or a big reconstruction, um, I'm still asking them six weeks, but I'm asking to be a lot more cautious with their activities post-op. Okay, definitely makes sense. Um, is prolapse something that I should be, whenever I go to my gyno to get checked, is this something that we need to be having a conversation about? Like, hey, can you check? Can you check? Um, look, is it is it a normal conversation that I should be having with my gyno, or I, I should I be goes, having issues? Yeah, th and if you said it to your gynecologist, they would be pretty impressed that you were a, a savvy patient, that you were fairly educated about what what your pelvic support was, and it would be fairly easy for them to say, "Oh no, I don't see any signs of it. Just keep doing what you're doing." Especially as a trainer, right? Like. You're showing sometimes patients things, you're manipulating and helping them to mm -hmm. hold their bodies in certain ways when they're doing exercises. So it puts you at a little more risk. And so you want to protect yourself to do preventative things so that you don't harm while you're trying to help. Uh, but I think for most of our gynecology colleagues, um, they are comfortable making a, an assessment of what kind of prolapse it is. Most of them will refer to me in order to assess like what are the options because they don't always have the options available in their offices. Okay. Whew, a lot of great information. I cannot okay. stress that enough. Like I learned a lot today, not only from the standpoint um, of a woman, but just also being a trainer, just things that I didn't and never thought to consider when I'm training or when I'm training somebody else. So, mm -hmm. um, Thank you so much for sharing. Yeah, all of my pleasure. My pleasure. I love what I do. I really feel like, you know, it's become a little bit of, you know, my calling to be able to help women discover themselves a little better and um, advocate for themselves. So thank you for giving us the time to really talk about these issues. I mean, I can see your passion from how you talk and you speak and how you educate. So um, thank, you. thank you for just having a passion about what happens um, with our bodies, because we don't always take care of ourselves the way that we need to. So it's mm -hmm. great to know that we have somebody that can advocate um, and stand here for us. If people want to reach out to you, possibly get some more information or set up like a con consultation or even an appointment, where can they do that at? Yeah, so they would go to our website at the University of Maryland Capital Region Health. Um, our phone number, I think, is going to be on your site um, and they can call. But I think the easiest way to go online is is go online, make an appointment that way, because it doesn't matter when, doesn't matter where. You don't have to rely on somebody answering a phone. You can quickly do it whenever you need to and when it's convenient yeah. to do. And no question, ladies and gentlemen, because we may have a few guys watching right now. Oh. Yeah, no question is a stupid question. No question is a dumb question. Not at all. And a lot of times I'm having partners come in and they finally feel comfortable in this setting, being able to say, well, yeah, you know, I'm afraid to do this because, you know, it might hurt or, you know, or we stopped being intimate. So I love it when um, partners show up and they can talk because, you know, these things don't always um, kill you, but they can take your life away. Yeah. So. And we want, like I said earlier, we want to live our best life in 2021. Amen. And forward. So to ensure that we're living our best lives, we have to make sure that the life that we have is taken care of to the fullest. So, uh, Dr. Walton, thank you so much again. Thank A lot you. of great information shared today. I appreciate it. I know the DMV appreciates it. Um, thank you. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. DMV, this was another edition of Girl Talk Live. Have a great day.